Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about startup companies, technology, founders, entrepreneurship, venture capital, and the like. The show is brought to you today by our good friend Scott Walker of the Walker Corporate Law Group, as well as my turnstone, makers of fine, fine furniture, which I, Jason Calacanis, use on the daily. Thank you so much to our friends at Amazon Web Services for providing hosting, which would be really expensive considering hundreds of thousands of people are downloading the show every month. Yes, uh, that's a little pat on the back for myself and my team. A uh, lot going on today, and uh, we're going to have two great, great guests, Sarah Lacey from Pando Daily and Brian Clark, copy blogger, will be with us. These are two very, very intelligent and honest individuals, and we're going to talk about a lot of great things, including the iOS 7 debut. Um, Self-driving cars, Tesla entering the ring in that respect, a 3D sensor on Kickstarter that's raised over 500K, hackers crowdfunding, um, breaking the fingerprint scanner, and of course, the fingerprint scanner I refer to is the one on the iPhone 5S, which I just got, um, had to get in line at 5.30 in the morning, and by getting in line at 5.30 in the morning, I, I told somebody to get in line at 5.30 in the morning, um, so uh, let's get right to it, oh, and a couple of plugs, a couple of plugs, if I may, um, this week, in, oh, uh, Launch Mobile and Wearables is a conference we're doing. It's uh, almost sold out. It'll be 250, 300 of the top executives in mobile and the wearable space. And I'm just going to sit down and talk with them. And uh, you have to have a ton of money to go to that event. It's like $5,000. I don't know where we came up with that price, but it's absurdly expensive. But we gave 100 tickets to founders who couldn't afford it, so I feel good about it. And it's going to be a fantastic event in San Francisco. Go to mobile.launch.co, mobile.launch.co. Uh, September 30th and October 1st. And then This Week in Startups goes on the road October 4th in San Francisco with Steve Jurvetson, the investor in SpaceX and Tesla, among others. October 10th with Alexis from Reddit. You may have heard of that site in the top, whatever it is, 25 sites in the U.S. And October 11th, my guest at Twist Live in Boston will be none other than avid, uh, Oscar-winning, Emmy-winning, technologist and angel investor Bill Warner. So let's get right to it. Uh, on the program today, Sarah Lacey from Pando Daily. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing well. How are you? I am well. What's going on in your world? Ah, uh, Jesus. You know how it is. You know my pain probably better than most because I have two young children and you know that. <laughs> yes. I am building a content company, which is not easy and you know that. Yes. I'm getting in constant fights and you know that. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. The fun days of being the editor in chief of a new technology publication. <laughs> well, you know why it's you know why it's so uh, cantankerous, right? Why? Because there's so little at stake. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, that is that is how it is in the media business. Like somebody doesn't yeah. get a. It's pretty ironic, or, or it's pretty just bizarre. Somebody doesn't get a link, or they don't get credit for something. I mean, they feel so scorned, and it becomes such a big issue, doesn't it? I know. Well, and I've always said, you know, the only thing that thing that old media hates more than there being no well-paying jobs for journalists is when someone tries to create well-paying jobs for journalists. Yeah. Like the old media, new media war. It's like, this is still going on, really? Yeah, it's like, wow, you're trying to do something interesting. Let's criticize it. Uh, also on the program, Brian Clark, old friend of mine, the copy blogger. You can go check out copyblogger.com. Uh, Brian, you've become quite famous over the years. I mean... What exactly is it that you do these days? Explain to the Internet audience. Internet celebrity, man. That's the pinnacle, right? A web celebrity. Um, You're a web celebrity. <laughs> um, yeah, I've spent the last, you know, started out copy blogger as a blog, evolved it into an online trade magazine, and then started developing products and services the opposite way of usually how it goes with startups. But uh, we're starting to see a little bit of traction with people going, hey, maybe that's not a bad idea. Let's build a built-in market and then find out what they actually really want. So, uh, you know, the last two or three years have been a lot of product development. Um, we're having another great year and uh, we're set next year to unveil the complete content marketing solution we've been working on. So I'm pretty fired up. Uh, okay, so let's jump into the first uh, story. iOS 7 debuted this week. A lot of mixed reaction from users. Uh, killing apps being, uh, you know, a completely new experience. Scrolling folders. Everything just a little bit more complicated. Um, the new stuff is cool. It's uh, got a lot of animations and some very interesting design elements and colors. Um, and we have also uh, a slide about the Twitter reaction. Let's pull that up for a second uh, if we have it. The Twitter reaction was, oh, I have it. Huh. How do I get to that? <laughs> oh, I go to Keynote? There we go. Uh, so let me hit play on that. Ryan Block says uh, Apple can rebuild iOS 7 in less than a year, but it still needs to take Apple Store 
it just it still needs to take the Apple Store down worldwide whenever it adds a new product. Okay, iOS seven is the mentally handicapped child of Android and BlackBerry, according to Dale Ressi. Wow. wow. Uh, <laughs> how do you really fill it down? Mollywood. Whoa, whoa. I need three gigs of space to update iOS seven. Three gigs. Yes, I have a lot of photos on my phone, but. I think I prefer those. Uh, and Neil Dash, uh, I do like iOS 7. I think it's a worthwhile upgrade. I just has many old Windows-like era. Wow, just terrible grammar, Neil. Uh, <laughs> areas of we haven't updated this part of the UI yet. Um, I'm assuming, uh, Brian, you have it on your uh, phone or iPad. What do you think? Assuming just barely, because 11 p.m. last night, I'm reaching over to the iPad to set the alarm, and I see the update notification finally. You know, they don't give guys like me the early look. Um, so, of course, I had to stay up and update it and play with it a little bit. My impression is uh, I think it looks cool, but it's mainly because it looks different. I think there's a lot of new and shiny that's kind of just new and shiny. But it didn't eat my contacts like uh, IO six did yeah. and uh, I haven't even got the notification on the iPhone yet so I looked at you know I've been looking at the reviews as well um, I don't think it's quite the travesty but perhaps I just haven't dug deep enough yet it's a uh, it's certainly elegant and uh, Johnny I think I've, it is elegant yeah Johnny I've designed it so it's it is troubling though or questionable the decision to take an operating system that everybody loves and a UX that everybody loves and then put it, uh, just make such a radical change. I mean, what do you, why do you think they did that, Sarah, such a radical change? Well, you know, I think part of it is just Johnny sort of won the internal battle and he finally could get his hands on, you know, the whole user experience. So I think it's probably what he's been wanting to do for a long time. I mean, he always hated those sort of phony objects within the UI. But, you know, I think Apple is in such a damned if you do, damned if you don't position now. And it's so interesting to me because literally a couple years ago, it was they couldn't do anything wrong. And if you brought up anything like they're really hard to work with if you're a developer people will be like why do you hate apple and like now it's like they're getting mocked in sketches on conan like they can never not do anything right now and i think it's both sides are overstated i mean people are like you know everyone look we live with these things in our pocket they control all of our pictures they control all of our contacts it's how we're in touch with all of our loved ones it's like you make any change you slightly change the color and people are going to freak out like of course people are freaking out I think people are going to get used to it though, because I was it was shocking day one, and I had played with it before when the, you know the prototypes were out or the early developer ones. People put it on devices here, but it does get more elegant, and you sort of it, you can tell it's very well thought out, um, and it, it, you do start to get into a rhythm with it in day two or three. So I think if you're thinking about it's just an adjustment, and it's like yeah. people are bitching that Apple isn't innovating enough, but here they've done something very dramatic, like you said, yeah. with the UI that was working that everyone loved. It's like okay, let's pick the thing we're going to yell. At them about yeah well it's apple's a design company and i think this demonstrates it too too transparently um for example I, I have an older generation imac it works perfect it's the best computer i've ever had but i went in the apple store and saw the new thinner ones and i want it it i don't even know what the features are better i just want it because it's more elegant um and i think maybe this operating system change just kind of made it too clear that they are more design than substance sometimes, but design is what sells. So I, I think it's elegant, too. I, I want to play with it more. It does seem they have uh, got the magic back, at least on the iPhone side. There were people, hundreds of people, outside the stores around uh, the world today. I saw pictures from London of Om Malik and uh, Matt Mullenweg from WordPress, both online or just checking out the line. Um, what, what is it about the 5S, do you guys think, that is got people excited again? Well, I don't know what? because I've heard really mixed things. I mean, I don't know if this is a Valley thing or what, but like there's been huge division on like, was this a substantive le release or was this not? And like just in the last week, you know, we interviewed Phil Libin last week and yeah. he was saying that he thinks just the fingerprint thing alone has, you know, fundam Apple is fundamentally one identity on the yeah. phone. They have beat Facebook, they have beat, you know, PayPal, anyone who gives a shit about authentication and identity, they fucking want it game over. On the other hand, I talked to a couple hedge fund guys because I was trying to figure out like the public market sentiment on Apple and they were all like look Apple is in the middle they're not going after volume like Android or Google is and they're not innovating enough and I brought up the fingerprint thing with them and they were all the ones I talked to were like yeah but all you're doing is opening the phone with it 
why isn't this worked in the apps more? Why isn't it worked in the software more? So, you know, I don't know. I mean, from where I sit, it seems like people are just mixed on this phone too. But, yeah. you know, consumers must like it, and that's really who matters. They, they definitely did something great with the dual flash. The great, you know, new camera seems great, but it is incremental, and the processor is much more powerful. But again, for consumers, that's incremental. There's obviously no form factor upgrade when Apple does, you know, an, an S type upgrade when they add a letter to the existing number. It's not upgrading the actual hardware or form factor. And the fingerprint thing, I agree with Phil uh, from Evernote, um, who you talked to. It is a massive game changer in identity, but that's something that's very hard for people to understand in, in the public, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, it is. And I have a, you know, even when the praise is overwhelming or the negativity is overwhelming on iPhones and iPads, I make myself wait four months before I upgrade because it all shakes out by then, right? Mm -hmm. Can you really make a good decision with the punditry going at, you know, at that level during the initial week? So I'm going to let it cool down a little bit. Yeah, I um, no, I'm the opposite. I'm an idiot. I just buy everything the second it comes out and check it out because I just, I feel like it's sort of my job to just be super up on these things because then everybody asks me, what, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah. And if I say I don't have it or I just feel like I'm not doing a service. I'm just poor and I just got an iPhone 5 because mine died. So, so I'm I. off cycle. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing I don't understand is like people who are in the technology industry, I talk to like some CEOs of companies who build apps or they're, you know, technologists or CTOs and they're like, yeah, I'm going to wait for my contract to get the iPhone 5S. I'm like, but this is your work. You need to have the latest, yeah. like just upgrade it. But I guess this contract system. Dude, I remember, yeah. I remember when Paul Carr was launching Not Safe for Work and, you know, it started out, it was going to be like a very ebook heavy yeah. thing. And he bought every kind of e-reader like yeah. even the ones you'd never heard of and i was yeah. just like I, I did not even know that existed he has like a whole closet of like dead e-readers <laughs> all right moving on uh, something that's not dead tesla self-driving cars are coming soon uh, we know that, and a lot of people are working on it, obviously Google in a major, major way. But Tesla uh, said they're going to come out with the autopilot. Um, Musk says Tesla's, uh, Tesla's autopilot will handle about 90% of driving scenarios, and he wants it ready by 2016. Um, one of the great things that um, I saw was he tweeted, actually, um, he tweeted that he's looking for engineers for this specific project, and they'll answer directly to him. So obviously Elon understands how the Twitter works now. Um, so great. Yeah, it's so great. What was your reaction when you saw all this? Uh, I know that you I mean, like, uh, I think probably everyone here is like a massive Elon Musk fan. And it's like, I just, I've so lamented like the golden age of like Larry Ellison and Scott McNeely and these like crazy outspoken, like ball busting entrepreneurs. Like everyone got kind of media trained for a while and kind of boring. And like, I just love that Elon is like, he gets that like he is right now like the peak of his power and he'll just go in and tweet and like move a whole industry. Like yeah. I have no doubt just that tweet has like got every automaker freaked the fuck out. And like a couple years ago with electric cars, that was totally not the case. No one could freak them out. And it's like, even if he's not really going to make it a massive priority, just him tweeting it does so much for the technology and so much for the industry. And like, I love that he's unafraid to do that. Yeah, he's really come out of his shell uh, in the last year or two, and I guess the success of Tesla uh, makes it a little easier to do that. The Model S is such a fantastic car. Brian, your thoughts? Uh, bittersweet reaction to this. So I have a reservation on a Tesla S performance that I designed and built and, you know, went on the online thing. It's just a beautiful car. And my wife is winning the argument that now is not the time to buy it mainly because the infrastructure for the charging stations is not nationwide, but she has a point. But I only want to drive really fast to the airport. That's all I care about. She likes to drive cross country. So I'm thinking if I'm going to lose this argument and wait to get a Tesla, then perhaps you wait for this kind of innovation because Elon is the man. I have a very simple uh, solution for you. Number one, if you're getting the performance, you have 250 plus mile range anyway. If you have to go on a drive longer than that, there's a large series of um, uh, not just Tesla superchargers, but the smaller chargers, which do like 16 miles per hour. Um, right. And there's a bunch of those charging. So I use those all the time. You use a little tiny adapter that Tesla gives you with the car that you click into the Tesla adapter. So when I was, I drove to Vegas, I used a supercharger to get there uh, in Barstow, wherever it was, but I charged up at the Cosmopolitan at 16 hours, uh, 16 miles per hour. So that was fine. I just played poker for a couple hours. Um, 
But as another solution to you, if you, you really just do... dropped so many things in that description. I know that it's you crazy. have a Tesla, that you stay at the Cosmopolitan, that you go play poker for. <laughs> like it was a vintage we Jason know Little poker. rant there. Well, I was just oh. trying to like give you the real world scenario that I was. Just you know... how baller I was. <laughs> exactly, I was so baller. <laughs> um, but what's really interesting is if you have the car, you can always swap with a friend and let them drive your car and then take their gas power car. So I, I kind of think the. Um, the range yeah, I think thing you don't have over. an excuse, Brian. I think my excuse is that I have two children under two with grubby little paws, so I have to wait to get a Tesla. Well, you know what well, you do. That, is, yeah. There's that too. We've got a family of four and a Rottweiler, and that is a concern. But uh, Jason, I, you may be getting a call from my wife. Yeah, you just you got to do it. I I, I would uh, I would not wait. Um, okay, and then what do you think about the Google driving car, uh, Sarah? Is that is that ever going to make it to? Uh, and 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 what is Larry Page thinking when? He sees Elon tweeting like this, do you think? Well, I mean, again, I mean, this is one thing I love about Elon is like he's really good friends with those guys. And I think we've seen this over and over again. I mean, what I love about Silicon Valley and startups is there's so much personality and individual ego and legacy and decision that really moves these companies. And like, I think there's healthy competition between these guys. So, I mean, I think it might spur them more or get them to work together, which would be great. Yeah. But look, I think it's far more likely in a Larry Page run Google than it was an Eric Schmidt run Google. And I think the other big Google story this week was that that apparently they're starting a company to cure death. Yeah. I mean, like when you look at that, it's like Google just out ambitioned itself. It's like suddenly Google launching self-driving cars like does not seem that ambitious. So it's right. life you know, extension. I, don't know. I hope I hate driving. I hope everyone amazing in Silicon Valley goes after this. All right. When we get back from commercial break, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about self-driving cars and Living Forever, brought to you by Google. Uh, hey, thanks a lot, uh, Scott Walker from the Walker Carpet Law Group for sponsoring this week in startup. Four years, one of my most loyal uh, supporters and partners here on the program. And they're a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and startup. And they encourage fixed fees. And they believe that billable hours reward inefficiency. So you won't get those crazy emails from your attorney and then open up the PDF and then get that sticker shock. No, he'll tell you up front how much it's going to cost to do your angel round or whatever it is, employment contracts, uh, mergers and acquisitions, licensing arrangements, terms of service, privacy policy, all that good stuff. And uh, the lawyers all have decades of experience. You're not going to have junior associates working, uh, getting on-the-job training with your startup. A lot of startups use him. A lot of startups love him. And uh, he's really just a great guy who's in here for the right reasons. You can call him, 415-979-9998, 415 98 Scott at Walker Corporate Law .com, Walker Corporate Law .com, uh, on the web, and you can follow him at Scott Ed Walker on Twitter. Really great guy. Comes to all the events. You'll see him uh, just geeking out with startups, and uh, I really do appreciate the support, Scott. You're a real mensch. Okay, um, next up, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, I may skip ahead here, but I want to talk about this living for everything. Um, what, what did you think of that announcement, uh, Sarah, when you saw it? And, and, and what are they actually trying to do here? Is this, you think this is like a personal thing where Larry and Sergey are like, hey, we're 40. We've got all the money in the world. Can we, if we invest $10 billion or $5 billion, can we live an extra 10 years? Is it really like a very personal-based thing? Or do you think this is boredom? I mean, what, this is a very weird announcement, right? It's very weird. Um, you know, I think it's probably similar to Larry to Larry Ellison. You know, he got to a phase where it's like he had all of this money, he had done all this stuff. It's like you buy every car, you buy every, you know, you have every Japanese island, Lanai. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you, there comes a point where you don't have money to spend. And I and I think this generation of entrepreneurs, you know, you see this with Dustin Moskovitz wanting to give all his money to charity before he dies. Like, there is this like view now, I think, with entrepreneurs where it's like, you know, let's spend it all while we're here and not like create this like generations of entitled like dick children. And, you know, I, I think it's um, so I think it's a little bit of that, which is very cultural right now. I think it's um, you know, it's also just these guys think they can do anything. Yeah. Like, they've had a lot of success and like to their credit, like. Google Fiber has been like really amazing, like pushing forward on self-driving car, Google Glass. I mean, they they keep running out of things to be unambitious about. I mean, mapping the seafloor, like think about how many things they've done. It's like at some point you run out, you have to get to curing death. But I have to say, this is maybe where I'm not destined to be a billionaire mogul. This sounds horrible to me. I don't want to live forever. Do you? Exactly. Well, <laughs> what, what do you think, Brian, when you read this stuff? 
Well, I think it's a bunch of very, very, very wealthy people facing the prospect of their own mortality, and it scares them like it scares everyone else. But Sarah has a great point from a metaphysical standpoint. Do we really want to live forever? The flip answer is, oh, sure I do, but you might not if you got the opportunity. So this is a very well, I mean, big issue, and it is very weird that he's bringing it up. But yeah, What were we saying, Sarah? I was just saying, like, what state are you going to be in for that? living forever bit. I mean, most of the life that's been ex extended lately, people are having hip replacements, knee replacements. I mean, it's like not necessarily, I mean, are they going to slowly re replace every part of your body? And then is it, because, you know, we are the, the ultimate planned obsolescence as human beings. So right. then it's like, what is it that's really living forever? And also, I mean, call me crazy, but it's like, I've spent a lot of time traveling in the emerging world. And like, I spent time in pretty dangerous places. And my view was always, my slogan was always, I've had a good run. And it's yeah. like, there's sort of like not, you know, it, it makes life less exciting if there's not the threat of death. You know, it, there's something about, there being an alternative to life that makes well, life so valuable. We're and not talking I, I don't here, know, though. I, I find it weird. We, we, there's no chance they're going to extend life forever um, anytime but soon. Even Certainly not for their years, life. It sounds awful. But you have to. But you what have if they gave stop. you 10 more good years, 10 healthy years? So let's say you would make you have it to stop healthy. aging. It's not about extension. You have to stop yeah. aging. Yeah, which is what I think they're doing. Are we going staying after. alive, yeah. or yeah. are we going to be? You know. I think that's what they're going for, though, is having your 60s, or let's say your 70s and 80s, which is when people start to decline. I think they're saying, hey, let's make the 70s and 80s vibrant, great years, and, you know, hey, you can die in your 90s or in your hundreds. I mean, that would be a deal a we'd all take, of, right? That would yes, be, but it's like there is also a massive acceptable. economic issue here. Yeah. Because, you know, we already have a problem where retirement age is fixed and ever it's like the third rail of politics to suggest it should be otherwise. And like, we don't have the money for everyone to live another 10 years, do we? No, you get to keep working because you're healthier. <laughs> yeah, but there's no jobs left. And then like, there'll be all these young people. There's a lot people. of Walmart greeters. Exactly. <laughs> gotta, be, gotta, be, gotta be an old entrepreneur. <laughs> all right, uh, continuing on. Um, and, and best of luck to uh, Larry Page on releasing the Larry Page S model in uh, 2070. Uh, I mean, it really <laughs> would, would be interesting, though, if they do extend their lives by 20 years or something like that, and we have this rich class of people who live to 120, and everybody else lives to 85 or 90. It's going to be pretty um, I think it's fucked up. It's There's pretty Bruce, fucked, I up. Really I fucked up. I agree. There's a Bruce Sterling I mean, book called Holy movie. Fire that deals with this issue. It's a good read. So. Um, there was also Prometheus had the Wayland Corporation, and Wayland, uh, you know, really wants to live forever as part of his thing. Uh, from the chat room, take advantage of end of life wisdom in your 90s. Okay, yeah, that's whatever. Who cares? Wisdom, whatever. <laughs> These guys just want to live forever. I mean, uh, okay, so moving on. Next up, uh, let's talk about our launch of the week. Uh, this is where we go through three. Um, Companies, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about what they launched this week. Uh, Plaid, Plaid, is it Plaid? Yeah, Plaid wants developers to pull financial data through an API. GigaOM was pretty hot on it. Potential uses: if this, um, then f that functions. For example, checking account hits X, transfer Y to savings. One of our tax clients built an application that allows users to scan their bank and credit histories to quickly identify deductible expenses. Uh, in the past, you had to m mail your statements and receipts to your accountant. Taking Mint to the next level with cleared, a uh, cleaned mer merchant name, category, street address, etc. What do you guys think of the uh, Plaid launch? I think this is one of those unsexy businesses that could make a ton of money, and I would keep an eye on it because, effectively, what they're doing it's bigger than than people might understand in the sense that. So I used to be an attorney. And even with marketing and advertising things, there are certain regulated industries where people are afraid to provide services or products because they have to comply with all those regulations. That's never bothered me because like financial services, they have a lot of things they have to comply with when they do anything online. Um, because I have the background, I could navigate that and that's a competitive advantage. But what Plaid is doing is basically becoming a regulatory and security conduit for developers. So you don't have to have that sophistication or that war chest for the attorneys to deal with the regulatory issues. Plaid is taking that on, putting it in an API, and so you can be a game developer 
and gamify financial services without ever dealing with the risk, the security, the regulation, and the legal fees, I think it could be huge. Twilio for banking, what do you think, Sarah Lucy? I don't know. I think anything consumer facing that's financial. It's one of those areas like healthcare that like developers just don't rush into. Um, you know, I think we, we saw this with like there was a big push that there were all these cool health things that you could do with with iPods where you can make them into like defibrillators and like, you know, check blood, blood sugar everywhere and like all of these really, really cool apps. And it's like, you know, they ever they try to make these sectors sexy over and over again. And like even when you have great APIs and you have ways to skirt some of the other stuff. I don't know if it's just something that developers get excited about. And I think there's a major consumer trust issue when it comes with a lot of, and there's also that whole thing of, um, you know, designing sites for like the way we are, not the way we wish we were. I mean, I look at so many like budgeting apps and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, I wish I had the discipline to use this, but I just don't. And for the same reason I don't balance my checkbook. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to think this solves all the problems. It's going to unlock a ton of financial services innovation, but I may just, you know, yeah, I mean, it, I agree with this, you know, issue around without, you know, health, financial, uh, very hard nuts to crack as a startup. But part of the reason it's hard is because there's not APIs available. So maybe this yeah. inspires people because they can go a little quicker and they don't have to, you know, do the middleware. Spark Capital, Google Ventures, and NEA are the investors, which we all know. Those are pretty, um, pretty awesome investors. So obviously something going on there. When we get uh, back from the commercial break, we'll uh, talk about our next two uh, launches this week, Sequoia launching Grove and a mobile 3D sensor that raised over 500K in their first week on Kickstarter. Let me just take a pause for the cause and thank our friends over at uh, Turnstone. My Turnstone uh, makes simple and smart furniture solutions for small businesses and startups. We use them here at launchandinside.com. Uh, beautiful, gorgeous furniture, but it's not going to break the bank. And you can go to myturnstone.com slash twist and get 10% off your first order. This offer is only for you, our loyal this week in startups listeners we're also and here it is beautiful stuff as you can see um you can like it's got integrated couches it's just very modern uh, simple clean nice to work on it's got those like trows in the middle of the desk so you can put all your cables in it cable management or have monitors floating all that kind of sexy awesome modern startup startup or ad agency furniture but not at those ridiculous prices you know some people are charging five or ten thousand dollars a workstation this is a fraction of that um hey here's a great contest send a picture of yourself grinding away building your startup company at your turnstone turn desk and send that picture to turnstone at launch.co turnstone like turning a stone at launch.co and you will be entered into win you will win a free lunch with me and a free buoy which is their very cool ergonomic seat that you sit on and it like makes you um, focus your core and all that kind of stuff myturnstone.com slash buoy b-u-o-y thanks a lot to my friends at my turnstone all right there you go uh there's your commercials does, does that work do you have the seat that makes you focus on your core i don't what i've been doing is i have the stand-up desks from uh like which i'm standing at actually during the show here and these things uh they come up right above your navel but you know your belly button about and i'm standing at it right now so i stand during the show right now and um I use it upstairs as well when I'm working, and I have one of those laptop stands that puts your laptop up at an angle. And I got to tell you, I feel so much stronger and better and not tired because I stand for, I don't know, six of the 10 hours a day I work, uh, much better. I think standing, like, I don't think standing only is a good idea because I do feel it on my knees yeah. and my ankles when I did it all day, but definitely standing. And then what happens is people just collaborate. They walk over with their laptops and they'll just hang out with me over there for an hour talking about stuff. It's much better. Standing is like a good part of the rotation. Uh, but I want to. What do you use? Just a regular Arion chair or something? I mean, if that, like, yeah. if we don't do anything. But right. I walk all the time now. I now walk whenever I'm on the phone, and I walk to work. Um, wow. So, and I just do all my calls then. So, like, I'm doing a good like thirteen thousand steps a day. Yeah, you you look thin. You got the you you losing the baby weight. Look at that thin face. Yeah. yeah I've you would since the since the peak of nine months pregnant, so this includes the baby, but since the peak of nine months pregnant, I've lost 50 pounds. Wow. That must feel great. That's like... It uh, does. Uh, yeah, you can uh, definitely tell. All right, here, let's go on to the next story. Um, all right, here. Um, Sequoia has launched Grove, a content site for entrepreneurs. Um, it's uh, opening up for country clubbish uh, Sequoia, which has been, you know, they're kind of like... 
I wouldn't say the one of the venture firms that's way out there. As a matter of fact, they didn't even do speaking gigs five or six years ago that often now that you see them out a little bit more. And they're uh, using portfolio companies, talent for content, Phil Libin from Evernote, Ryan Smith from Qualtrics. Uh, you can go see it at Sequoia uh, Cap and uh, dot com slash Grove. So what do you think of this, uh, Sarah? I mean, is this competition from Sequoia, is Sequoia and LinkedIn? Because LinkedIn now, they hired Dan Roth. What, what do you think of brands or social networks now getting into the content business, getting all these CEOs to do free content, which Ev Williams was saying uh, when he was explaining Medium to the TechCrunch folks that, hey, the uh, experts are better than the journalists, and you would rather yeah. hear an expert than a journalist. You buy it, yes or no. You obviously have a lot of contributors in your network as well. I mean, I love contributors because it's like people I don't have to pay who write content for us. Yeah, that so. seems to be why everybody loves them. <laughs> I so I get it. But I mean, look, I mean, this is not surprising coming from a career journalist. But like, I think, you know, the reason our guest posts do really well is because like we have a really phenomenal editor in Adam Pinnenberg who spends a lot of time working with the guest posters to make sure their stories read really well. I mean, not just because someone is brilliant as a CEO does not mean they're a great writer and does not mean that they will, for a lot of people who don't write for a living, taking the time to sit down and write, it takes a lot of time for them. So, you know, I think guest posts are always, and guest contributors are all always good as part of a mix. Um, I think when it has to carry, you know, a site, it's hard. But look, I think Sequoia has done this in a really smart way. They're not trying to be newsy. They're doing evergreen content. The UI is really nice. The way they're organizing it in terms of, like, these are all our articles about funding. These are all of our articles about this. You know, I think that they have a marketing problem in getting the world's entrepreneurs to actually realize all of this wisdom is on their page and where to go for it. And I think that's the hard part. But I think that a lot of the content will be interesting for interest people at different points in their journey, and it doesn't necessarily have to be newsy at any given point. I mean, I was teasing them when I talked to them about the story because I was like, oh, well, like, you guys have never been, you know, particularly friendly to the world outside your portfolio. And they were like, oh, come on. And I was like, hey, your URL is sequoiacap.com. Like, it's not even an intuitive URL. Um, so I think for the firm, this is a big move. It's just, you know... I mean, as a content site, I'm not super worried about them becoming competitors. I think it's doing something very, very different. Hey, Brian, I mean, this is in your real house. What do you think? I mean, brands are getting uh, more and more into the content business. Uh, what do you think of a venture capital firm becoming essentially a publisher? I, you know, I love to see something like this. I agree with Sarah on some of their challenges on actually getting the word out. Um, but of course, Sarah did some of that for them, which was a good start. Um, <laughs> You know, so in essence, uh, this is a classic content marketing play. Uh, but what I like about it is it's a it's a higher level of media play in the sense that it looks more like a magazine. It's not like ABC with Fred. It's not Brad Feld's thoughts. You know, and both of those guys had a great amount of success in in building their thought leadership, which I hate that word, but that's the word Feld calls it. Um, and so I like the fact that they're taking more of a media approach. I do not think they are a threat to Pando Daily, but I do think this is a good move for them as a brand. The second thing, uh, which Sarah also pointed out in her article, is that they hired Ben Worthen from the Wall Street Journal. Again, making it more like a true media publication and hiring an actual journalist to help run it they've got their heads in the right place. I mean, if they got some outside help on this, they got good advice. Uh, and then finally, I, and I also love the fact that they've, they've got, it's not just the principles of Sequoia that are doing the writing. They're, they're going out to their founders, who are probably are, Sarah, a little more new media savvy and maybe better writers than you might expect, give or take, depends. Um, I just hope that I don't ever go to that site and see an ad, a banner ad, because... Yeah, and they don't need to make money from it. And right. But I mean, is yeah. this you what's... Know, that, Sarah, is this what's going to happen? All uh, journalists will wind up working for... Public, or a lot of journalists are going to find their next jobs working for brands. I mean, in a way, this is um, native advertising in almost the purest sense for Sequoia. I mean, they're showing off Phil and other entrepreneurs in the, in the portfolio, and they're showing off their intelligence and 
their deafness um, in terms of their ability as entrepreneurs or to price a product in this case, in Phil's case. And that's going to you know, be content for limited partners who give Sequoia money to invest in and for future entrepreneurs who want to join it. Um, are all journalists going to start working for LinkedIn and these kind of places? I don't think all journalists are. I think what we're seeing is the same thing that I've seen throughout my career with jur why journalists go to work at PR firms. I mean, for a very long time, you know, I feel like every job I've had, it's like 10% of the journalists wind up staying in journalism and right. like 90% continually go into PR. And I think this is another similar angle where people feel like effectively they're selling out. I mean, sorry, that's just reality. Um, but, you know, at least they feel like they're selling out for a brand versus um, they're selling out you know, to go like shill someone's product more directly. But I think it's more of that. And I think the journalists who are really hardcore and the journalists who love being journalists and love talking truths to power and cover what they want and don't want to be beholden and don't give a shit about a bigger paycheck will stay in journalism, same yeah. as we saw with PR. Uh, okay, so um, moving. Oh, it's a last question, uh, Sarah. If I have an article and I've got LinkedIn or Pando Daily or Business Insider or Quartz or any number of places that want me to give it to them, how should I as an entrepreneur make that decision? Well, I think it depends on who you want to read it. You know, I mean, look, if, even if you're de deciding, even if you decide you want to go with a media brand and you're thinking about like us versus TechCrunch, like TechCrunch has more of like a fanboy wider distribution than we do. We have much more like investors and entrepreneurs and like more of like hedge fund readers and more general business audience. So I think you always have to think about the audience that you want to reach. I mean, but you know, I've told the Sequoia guys, like I'm happy to like cross post pieces that they do if they yeah. want to reach a wider audience. You know, Ben Horowitz has always done that with his blog. Um, I think, you know, people people are smart about cross-posting. We cross-post some stuff for Medium, yeah. um, you know, and we're happy to do that because, you know, we reach a different audience. I, I do think, and I'm interested in your take, Jason, since you were sort of inside Sequoia for a while. Yeah. I thought this was really clever because I know the Sequoia guys historically do not like to create superstar partners. And a lot, and they don't like individual partners to be the focus ever. And I think that this was a smart way for them to create more of a brand for the firm, more content, get into the blogging social media game while making the brand and the portfolio front of mind, which is what they've always said they do as a firm. I mean, I thought it was a clever way for them to become more modern and not betray what they've always said. Yeah, I mean, it's not. You're not pulling it up and being like, oh, here's Roloff Botha on pricing. It's, you know, here's a portfolio company, right? So they're, they've always said, and I'm, listen, full disclosure, they're an investor in Inside.com, and I was part of the Sequoia Scouts, you know, little angel investing project, and uh, still am. And so I- Can I, I, can I say, say one thing yeah. about the selling out thing? And I know mm -hmm. where that's coming from, and I get it. Um, and I think we're seeing a shift in attitudes. It's going to take a while to get there. But- you know, that's assuming, I mean, if you're working for a brand, at least you know where the bias is and a lot of good content marketing is less biased and less pitchy than you might expect. But this assumes that normal journalism is objective. And if you've seen Citizen Kane, which was about William Randolph Hearst, you know it's never been the case. I'm not saying that about Sarah, of course. But this selling out mentality, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair. And um, brands can pay journalists while a lot of me, true media publications no longer can, especially online. With the, you know, Sarah, are you doing native advertising yet? Because banner ads are in the toilet, basically. Um, we do, but the way we don't do it in a way where they get to control what we write at all. We have a very oh, old cool. school yeah. model where it's basically like an emphasis section. And if you want to be the sponsor right. of e-commerce, you can be the sponsor of e-commerce. But we don't do anything where they give us copy or control what we write. So uh, native advertising is actually separate from content marketing. But native advertising is a thing that's going to save journalism online because at least people see the ads on mobile devices and et cetera. But, but so, I still anyway. think it, there is a difference between working for a site that has native advertising and working for Sequoia. I mean, working for the Wall Street Journal, writing about startups versus working for Sequoia, doing content for their startups. I mean, you know, sell, maybe selling out is a harsh term, but you got to call it something because it's not journalism. It's not the I same think it's a, thing. It's a huge shift that's going on. It'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, here's an example. Uh, on uh, Pando Daily, we see the Patent Troll Smackdown, a Pando series presented by Application Developers Alliance. So you have somebody underwriting, not dissimilar than Frontline or uh, NPR, yeah. 
uh, a, a content series they want to be aligned with. This is actually probably, you know, the, the height of uh, partnership and sponsorship with advertisers. But native advertising would be, for the audience who hasn't heard that term, um, Sarah's writers or another write, group of writers write content that is al alongside the Pando native content, the Pando actual editorial, um, about the sponsors. And it's sometimes clear labeled and not. Obviously, Pando Daily doesn't do that, but BuzzFeed is um, perhaps um, the best uh, example of doing that. But I have to say, I think the FTC is going to come down super hard on people. Um, if you look at this, uh, pan if you look at BuzzFeed right here, which I'm pulling up on my screen, you'll see tons and tons of links. And then it says, Italian lawmakers hold kiss in in parliament for LGBT rights. Right below it, 12 things women say about losing weight and what they really mean. And then below that, 16 things to remember before the Castle season premiere. It turns out, which one of those do you think would be most likely to be an ad? Well, there's a slight, slight yellow um, uh, shade behind the middle one, and it's that is actually the one. It says presented by Slim, Slim Fast, and then in the smallest possible font on the bottom right, it says featured partner, not advertisement, uh, not sponsor message, fe featured partner. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that when you actually click through to and you look at that page, you would really never know this is an ad. It uses the same content management system, it uses the same editorial format, and from what I understand, they use the same writers. Sarah, well, you sometimes the brands you're, can actually right. go into the CMS themselves and write it, which to me is more egregious. So, Sarah, you would never yeah. do this. Why? Look, I, I actually am not quite as snobby as a lot of journalism purists are about this, because if you look at a, a women's fashion magazine, there are advertorials in there all the time. I mean, I don't think for all media, this is the end of the world. I think for the business press, like there are people who are coming to us to make decisions on where they work, to make decisions on where they invest, um, what they use. I just think our trust is the only thing we have because we're not really going for a mass mega page view grabbing site. We're going for trust and influence. And I just think that you can't play around with that. It's not worth it to us in the long term. I'm long term greedy, not short term greedy. Here's a second example. This is Quartz, QZ.com, which is part of the Atlantic Media Group. And they have fantastic native advertising in terms of execution. You scroll down to the end of this Apple uh, iOS 7 iPhone story, and then uh, right at the bottom, all of a sudden, you have uh, sleep well, knowing all of your stuff is connected from Union Bank. And then it goes to another story about BlackBerry. You scroll down, uh, and you see the Union Bank ad again. And then sometimes they'll actually have another story there. So here it is, Bulletin by Siemens. And they're doing, it's a sponsor content, very, very um, clearly above the headline. Uh, but it still is in the same exact thread of the stories. Brian, good, bad, otherwise, what do you think? Well, look, you know, I, I think it's the only advertising format that's going to work. I think you're right. Those who try to uh, hide the disclosure are going to get slapped very hard, both by Google and the FTC. But you got to understand, there's been formats of this for decades. Um, it's the advertorial, and even the old school print advertorial was better disclosed than some of the stuff you see online. David Ogilvy in 1956 was doing content focused advertisements, but it was quite clear that Guinness Beer was sponsoring the Guinness Guide to Oysters. So those who play fair and retain trust will serve their audience and they're going to get more and better advertisers. I think Sarah's exactly right. The integrity and trust is all you have with an audience. Brian, uh, tell us, when you look at uh, BuzzFeed, and you have it right there in front of you, and you, I know you're very familiar with the site, um, could they do a better job disclosing what's an ad and what's not? Uh, I think they could, absolutely. Um, they have been very innovative. I'll give them that. Um, but again, you know, a lot of the uh, brand journalism or content marketing you're seeing, there's no question. People know it's coming from someone with an interest in hopefully you becoming a customer. Then you have the BuzzFeed CEO saying, oh, give up your corporate blogs, give up your own content. Uh, you, you should just advertise with us. That's actually dangerous. I, I get what he's trying to do for himself, but that's a dangerous sentiment and they're not a very Why good is it dangerous? Why is it dangerous exactly, Brian? Because a direct relationship with an audience and a brand is worth infinitely more. You build your own media asset. You're building your mm -hmm. own channel. Yeah. And you don't want to keep renting someone else's audience um, unless you have to to supplement your own direct relationship. So you're a fan of the Red Bull approach of uh, we have our own YouTube channel. We're going to do the space jump. We're going to do this other stuff. Come to our Red site. 
Red Bull is exceptional. I, I think, and you wouldn't think it would work for an energy drink, but they were very creative in how they did that. When you look at Gawker.com's, um, I mean, those, that's another one where I have to look very closely to try to figure out what's an ad. Here we go. Um, Mitt Romney losing control of what is, uh, I'm trying to see if I can figure out what's an ad here. Uh, Bitcoin, badasses, media, Blackberry, um, Louis C.K. have babies. Hmm. I don't seem to actually see an ad here, which means there either are no ads right now or it's so cleverly disguised I cannot actually find it. Um, well, I know you go way back I mean, the with good Nick, thing about um, Gawker is but- – Gawker never tells the truth anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> hey well, zing pow! You know, the whole thing that, of Nick Denton saying he's going to do branded, com- what was it, commerce journalism. That's affiliate marketing. Hey, welcome to 1996. You know, I mean, it's funny to me that an that, uh, often maligned industry uh, that's actual, actually, when well done, quite uh, clear what's an ad, what's sponsored, what's a pitch that you're getting paid for. Um, that Gawker, that's Gawker's new model. Listen, I, Nick and I have become great friends over the years because uh, we're not in competition anymore. But when Inside.com comes, comes out, he will go back to hating me again. Hey, let's go to the next story. Because uh, we're going to be right back in it again, baby. I'm ready, Nick. Let's do it. But here's the thing, here's the thing about ready. Nick. Like, I'm I, don't, I don't even think he hates me. We've always had really pleasant interactions. He just finds me to be a great character. And his whole thing is like, I want narratives around people I can turn into two-dimensional characters. And it's like, I don't think even for everything they write about me that they even hate me. You they are a capitalist that- free market monster, Sarah Lacey. <laughs> you <laughs> free market Godzilla. <laughs> what does that even mean, a free market monster? They know. destroyed you for... What being upset at what buses or something like that, or people on buses? If, if you actually read my, I mean, Farhad did a brilliant story a um, rebuttal, yeah. in Slate about this, where he was like, "Okay, look at like," and he just used me as an example, but he was like, "Look at what she actually wrote. Like, it in no way is egregious or pro free market." And like, as you know, we've like attacked the overly free market tactics at Silicon Valley. It's right. just they just they they. They want you, I mean, it's like Denton says, these are the characters in Silicon Valley. These are the people that you regularly go after, and this is the caricature of them. Go after this. And it's like, that's what they do. And it, it doesn't have any bearing on what anyone does. I mean, yeah. when Biddle started at Valleywag, he was following three people on Twitter. Me, Arrington, and Paul Carr. He was clearly told from the beginning, the three characters you go after. The you know? And fine, <laughs> if going after me drives traffic, Bring it on. Great. More inbound links. I for take Pan- it as a compliment. Yeah, and more inbound links in Google Juice for Pando Daily. I have to say, though, I personally am appalled by the behavior of Valley Wag, uh, specifically because I am no longer one of their favorite characters. Um, <laughs> I, I've become irrelevant. <laughs> There's nothing to make fun of. I've made fun of myself too effectively just by my own existence. <laughs> Uh, you know what? You're going to get newsy again in the fourth quarter. Oh, when I let me tell You'll you something. When I get inside.com launched, they're going to be coming <laughs> after me again. Uh, okay, listen. Enough of that. Let's get back to the launch of the week. Mobile 3D sensor raises 500k on Kickstarter. Uh, we have a video. Is that correct? Can be we able play? To capture every dimension of an entire room in a matter of seconds, and you can send a model to your phone so you can get any dimension you need at any time. You'll be able to easily capture and send three-dimensional objects across town or across the world and make decisions together, even when you're apart. You'll be able to play games, games where the real world becomes the game world. Wow, Uh, pretty amazing stuff, kind of sci-fi. What do you you think, Brian? Have you uh, followed this uh, incredibly successful? They've done six times their goal already. It almost feels too good to be true because the video has such amazing graphics in it. And it looks like they spent $10,000 on this video. What do you think, Brian? So this is amazing technology. It's amazing to me what we continue to develop. And it's, it's a space I've been following, the whole 3D scanning, modeling, and of course, personal fabrication, printing, all of that. That's gonna change the world. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't see this until today. This is a Boulder, you know, they've got a Boulder office. They were a tech stars company in 2008. Uh, you know, Foundry and Brad Feld have invested in them along with another firm. So it's a bolder thing and I wasn't paying attention, but I'm, I'm really fascinated. I'm considering uh, actually contributing at the $500 level just to get in on this early. Um, but here's the interesting thing to me from a marketing perspective. 
they're funded by some heavyweight, you know, uh, VC firms. They didn't need $100,000, right? So you're doing two things here with Kickstarter. Pre-sales, very smart. With some products, say online education, you, can, you could sell an idea, collect the money, and deliver over time. Okay, now they're at, you're able to do that with a, manufact, a piece of hardware. That, that's kind of fascinating that we can do this, especially since they're over half a million already. But what do you think about this as a marketing event? Even beyond the money, even beyond the pre-sales, everyone's going to be talking about this, and they're going to get a lot of amazingly free buzz that they got paid for instead of paying money for. I think that's genius. Yeah, yeah but it's like also, yeah, I, I look, I love the hardware revolution that's happening on Kickstarter, and I love that you know when someone like um, Ouya goes out to raise venture capital, and everyone says, "No, too risky for us." Even though we're supposed to be taking risk, they can take it directly to consumers and say, "Hey, do you want this?" And people are like, "Shit, yeah!" And they give them a ton of money. Like, I love that whole aspect of Kickstarter, but like. I do think it's kind of bullshit when a funded company goes and does it. And it's like, I'm not for sure that they're always making that clear to consumers that this is not an Ouya Pebble Watch situation. Yeah, and I, I had that's issues an with Remotive. Point. I did. I had issues with Remotive, who went out and originally did a Kickstarter campaign and got a lot of attention. And then they went and raised a lot of money, including from Sequoia. I mean, they're not exactly a have-not. And then they did a second Kickstarter campaign, and they did it because of marketing. What? But like... If you're funded by Sequoia, do you need Kickstarter? Like, why are we mad at like Veronica Mars and like other Spike Lee for doing Kickstarters when and we don't have an issue with like venture funded companies taking their yeah? I think this is a consumers. It's a, I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and while there is something to the fairness of Kickstarter, right? It's supposed to be there for people starting off with new stuff. I do kind of think that what clearly the reason people are doing this is. They they want to create buzz and get those thousand true fans for the Spike Lee film or the ten thousand true fans and build the pre buzz. So I was talking to one director of note and um, even bigger than Spike Lee, and he can get any movie funded. He's got a lot. He's got uh, an Just Oscar. Just go ahead and drop his name, Jason. I can't. Just I can't. But anyway, he's an Oscar. He's got an Oscar, <laughs> and uh, that narrows it down. But you know, as a director, <laughs> but he um, he's thinking about doing it because he has no relationship with the fans. He doesn't have any of their emails. Yeah. He doesn't know who his fans actually are. And so now if he could get those 100,000 or 10,000 emails, it would set him up for success. But it does feel unfair because when you look at these things, wow, they can produce a better video than the person in the corner. I'm, I'm kind of torn by it. But okay, cool. But this like, all goes look, back to the I don't the, know, Quentin Tarantino or whoever you're trying to talk about here. Give them an experience that no one gets. You right. know, like Mar Margaret Atwood. I'm a massive Margaret Atwood fan. She just did a promotion on her book that's like this third, the third in the trilogy of the Orcs and Crake, which is like one of my favorite books of all time. And she basically allowed people to like bid for charity and they could, their name would be in her book somewhere. And it's like, if you are a huge fan, like that's phenomenal. I mean, do stuff like that that's like your true fans are able to give you money and it's an experiential thing that you wouldn't have been able to get, great. But don't say this is making the movie possible like there's no other way it would get done. Brian, what do you think? Well, two, two points about this particular case. Um, there's nothing wrong, I guess, with pre-selling. I, I do agree that it might not be that clear to people that they are VC funded. But this is the way the internet works, and I think we're, this is part of this big transformation I was alluding to before. It's a direct medium. If you can go directly to your fans, if you can go directly to customers or clients, you should do that. And that does scare intermediaries. And the fact that you don't even need Kickstarter, someday Kickstarter will be disintermediated, right? Hmm. Um, but, you know... Anyway, uh, let's move on here. The uh, video, uh, just so we'll, we'll pick our uh, launch of the week, um, Plaid wants developers to pull in financial data through its API. Uh, Sequoia Capital wants you to go to uh, the Grove and get great content from their uh, founders. Um, and, of course, uh, mobile 3D sensor raised over 500K on Kickstarter in order to put uh, a 3D sensor on your iPad and make spatial renderings of an entire room, take measurements of objects in 3D space. And the really cool feature, if you put the um, Oculus Rift 3D like virtual reality headset on, you could actually make a room into a 3D environment in real time and then put yourself into it, even though you're already in the room, which I don't 
I guess you could just take the <laughs> Oculus Rift off and you would still be in the room looking at your hands. Well, but the, anyway. the other thing they're trying to do, Jason, with yeah. this Kickstarter thing, I think, is kickstart the um, development community because they are yeah. focusing on what you do with the technology as opposed to just consumer sales. Sarah Lacey, Plaid, Grove, Mobile 3D, what do you think? Who's your pick of the week, the launch of the week? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Mobile 3D because it's the coolest and it's the most out there. Okay. And copy blogger, what do you think? I'm proud of Sequoia, but I got to go with um, yeah the uh, mobile 3D thing. That's just too cool. Okay. Uh, uh, Occipital, is that the name of the company, Gina? Occipital, am I pronouncing that correct? Anyway, uh, hmm, let me think about this for a second. Uh, Sequoia launching a uh, content site. Mm, I think that's nice, but I don't think it's uh, the launch of the week. Um, Plaid, developer API, that's nice. Uh, it's going to be useful. But yeah, the mobile 3D sensor is uh, clearly the winner. Uh, great sweep, and that is the launch of the I week. I like that you pretended to deliberate. I, well, I had to. I mean, it really was. <laughs> I, you know, this is only the third week we've done this, and honestly, it's, uh, oh, sensor structure is the name of the 3D sensor. I'm sorry. Sorry to sensor structure. Sensor structure. Yeah, let's get, let's get the name as we give. I don't know. Sorry. My, uh, yeah, it's my so fault. because are the... by the science that we can't remember the brand. Well, you know what? It's not even. <laughs> the 3D mobile thing. It's not even. No, no. My, the show notes aren't clear, but also it, it's not clear from the, from the, uh, the Kickstarter page even what the name of the company is versus the name of the product. It, it all gets so confusing. But it's the third week we're doing this, and um, we, we have to be careful to have uh, – at least some that are, it's clearly who the, uh, who the winner was. So we've got to have a little more parity there when we select it. But we'll do better in the next issue episode. Hey, uh, California is the first state to regulate ride sharing from Lyft, Uber, and Sidecar. The Public Utility Commission largely affirmed ride share companies. Criminal background checks and training for drivers are the key issue that they want to see happen. Minimum of $1 million uh, per insurance claim. No tolerance of drug and alcohol policy. That's on the part of the driver, not the passengers. Um, and the predictions, um, what will ultimately happen to the taxi and limo companies, I guess, is the question. Um, Sarah, what do you think now that California is uh, the first state to recognize the existence and, in fact, in a way, endorse these uh, new options? So this might surprise you since I am a free market monster. You are. <laughs> but but I, actually, I think this is... I, I think this is great, though. I mean, look, I think I've seen directly in San Francisco where these um, these services have had the most success that it has utterly changed cabs. I mean, you get in cabs now, they are thrilled to take credit cards. They are super clean. They are super friendly. Every cab driver is feeling the heat. And I think if the private market has put pressure on the public infrastructure to be better, then it's only fair that that, public in that private market also has to be held to a little bit of the same standard of the public infrastructure. Sure. We wrote a piece um, a, a couple of weeks ago about how we actually think that Uber, with all this money, is going to start looking a lot more like the taxi monopoly. You know, we think they're going to start buying cars and leasing them to drivers. We They're clearly being super aggressive and cutting costs to go after these guys. I mean, Uber has the ambition and increasingly the money to really almost become a mop monopolist player in a lot of markets. And I think if that's the case, I hope someone is holding them accountable for the basics of human safety. You know, yeah. up until now, these companies have been saying, well, you can trust us, so it's okay that we're not regulated. And, like, I just – I don't think we can be in that position forever. Well, uh, full disclosure, I'm an uh, Uber angel investor, and uh, I hope it becomes a huge monopoly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're a free market monster. I am a free market monster as well. No, I mean, the one, I mean, the one great upside to it all is just in terms – like you're saying, driver behavior has become so amazing, both in the it's Uber so network great. and outside of it. It used to be getting in a cab oh was dangerous, right? And they, they would mm -hmm. be nasty to people or worse. You know, Not everybody, obviously, but it's a very difficult job, and it's, and it's created some owner uh, – um, ownership of behavior. In fact, I had a really bad experience, not a terrible experience, but I had an Uber driver who made like two mistakes in the same ride and he was panicked that I was going to give him a bad rating. And I said, well, you know, you did make these two mistakes, but don't worry about it or whatever. And he followed me out of the car and he was like, please, sir, I really need this job. Please don't give me less than five stars or four stars because I can't afford to lose the They'll job. Get kicked out. And I was like, don't worry. I'll give you five stars. Just 
here's a little tip. Repeat back what the passenger says to you so you make sure there's clarity, you know? And mm -hmm. But I actually had a little bit of a conundrum. Like, I was like, well, I don't want to have a bad driver in the network, and but it just shows how much they care. What do you think, uh, copy blogger? I'm just not going to call you Brian anymore. I'm just calling you copy blogger to reinforce your brand. You know, I just last week started using my personal Twitter account so people would stop calling me copy bloggers. Like, this is Jason, mahalo, you know. Yeah, but, uh, inside dot com, please. <laughs> please, let the mahalo be. Oh, yeah. die. Let me get the current let it project. Die, let it die a slow, <laughs> let it die a, a peaceful death, okay? <laughs> it's nay on the mahalo. pay for that brand and now it's like gone? Uh, actually, I got mahalo.com for 12000 Um So that was a oh, pretty really? good bargain, yeah. And it still makes a million, over a million dollars a year in revenue, so it's sunsetting. I mean, it's great content, like a lot of great how to content. It's, it gets like 30 million views on YouTube. You know, it, it does well, but it's not a growing uh, concern. And uh, we're sunsetting it, as uh, the folks at Yahoo would say. <laughs> Um, okay, Brian, what are your thoughts? Copy blogger, please. Your okay, thoughts on so uh, regulations on Uber. As Lyft, soon as I saw cycle. the headline, I was reminded of another headline that appeared on The Verge a few weeks back, which was the, the decline of serial killers and the rise of the sharing economy. And I'm like, oh, I got to read that. But the basic gist of it was that the internet makes it harder to be a serial killer because of the transparency and identity and searchability. You can't just move from town to town and get away with killing people. Okay. I think uh, that's total bullshit, list, by the way. Right? <laughs> is it? But, I mean, um, let's think that through. Hold on a second. This is a fascinating topic. Is it harder to be a serial killer? No. Hmm. Well, if you were a cab driver, serial killer would certainly be harder because okay. all that stuff's being well, tracked. Empirically, whether this is true or not, serial yeah. killings have gone down. More mass shootings, but we characterize those Can I give you one data point? Yeah. Shirley Hornstein person highly connected in Silicon Valley, huge social footprint, massively lied about engagements she had, people she was dating, people she was friends with. She actually used social media to fabricate basically an entire identity. Right. Didn't she take, didn't she, is that the person who photoshopped herself with celebrities and then put it on Facebook? Yeah. And there is way deeper stuff in there about stuff that she did that like never really came out. I mean, she basically used social media in the most um, tech savvy, social media savvy part of the universe but and so had everyone believing fake stuff about her. She easily could have been a serial killer. Hey, hold on a second, though. We she it was easy to lie, but she quickly got caught. Was it was it a year of lying? No, two years? This went, no, this went on for a while and she stole from many startups. She got jobs at startups and stole from them, um, you know, over and over again and didn't get busted for a long time. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. okay. So, Brian, okay. back to you. But the point being that serial killers made us irrationally afraid. There's not that many of them, but you wouldn't pick up hitchhikers. You wouldn't let a stranger in your car. You wouldn't have a sharing economy. Okay, let's forget it from that point on. So the sharing economy is happening. Basically, people trust more for reasons attributed to the network. Well, let's accept that that's the case. How far do you let that go? So ultimately, I agree uh, with Sarah that I'm all behind the regulation of these people. I think it is going to impact uh, the taxis and the uh, town cars and what have you. Uh, but it's not going to kill them. It's going to make them raise their game. And I think from what I've heard in San Francisco, that's already happening. So I'm all for it. That may not be popular with the ultra libertarians, but you can't go too far on the trust end of things. OK, hackers are crowdfunding a reward for the first person to hack Apple's Touch ID. Touch ID is this uh, new silver ring around your home button on your phone. You put your thumb on it. It reads your fingerprint. People are trying to figure out how quickly they can embarrass um, Apple by hacking this. Uh, includes $10,000 from IO Capital. Uh, the link is uh, is Touch ID hackedyet.com is touchidhackedyet.com you can go take a look at that and uh, the answer <laughs> right at the top of the page there is no it has not been hacked yet um, but you can pull up my screen there yeah but the following people are contributing hundreds of dollars or bitcoins or whatever to do this uh, Brian what are your thoughts I can imagine a scenario where it'd be worth ten thousand dollars to someone to get into Jason's cell phone Right. Could you imagine you would you agree? Could, sure. Could, could be could be worth much more than that. So I think I'd like to know now with that kind of incentive whether it's possible. Yeah. I like it. I like these like cha hack it. challenge. You love it? Sarah, why? Yeah. Well, I mean, don't you want to know? 
Like, don't you want to incentivize everyone to go ape shit, every smart person to go ape shit and trying to hack it so that we can know and then they can patch it or fix it or we know what the risk is or whatever? It's, you know, I think it's great. Um, it certainly is interesting. I mean, Facebook is um, uh, Facebook is giving bounties for um, people picking up bugs, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, they pay for people to give bugs. So, um, Should be. Hey, as we're closing up uh, here, what are your thoughts on um, uh, All Things D breaking up with, this is another inside baseball thing, but All Things D led by uh, Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg is, leave, is not being renewed by News Corporation, which means they're going to leave with the staff, apparently start their own new tech blog with another name and I'm sure do conferences, and then I, it's unclear if News Corp is going to continue doing all things D, because they, they get to keep the house, as it were, they get to keep the website, or if they'll keep doing the D conference, which would be pretty hard to do, considering 100% uh, of it was done by uh, Kara and Walt and their teams. What do you think, Sarah? I think this is going to be one of those classic things to watch in terms of what's more valuable, the talent or the platform. Um, I think the brand and platform has, you know, has a lot of inertia. Media brands have a lot of inertia. And I think it is really hard to start from scratch. I mean, look at TechCrunch. All of the talent left. And it is, you know, it's not the same as it was, but it's still a big brand. I mean, look at Engadget. You know, some of these these things have a longer life than you imagine. I think they should try to keep both of them going because I bet they'll still make money from it. I bet they'll still get traffic. You know, we all obsessed with this in the inside baseball, but the average person who may go to the site or might go to the conference may not be aware that those guys did everything. So I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see how easy it is for Walt and Kara to start back up from scratch. I think it'll be a little harder than they think it is because when they started the initial one, they were under the umbrella of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It's never easy. Um, but, of course, we wish them luck. Uh, they do but a great I do, job. I mean, look, I hope they get the biggest valuation in the world. Yeah. I good for you. Success. I mean, part of, like, what is weighed on our whole space is, you know, you and Arrington selling your properties for fucking peanuts. So everyone go big <laughs> at high valuations. <laughs> Lift the comps. <laughs> yeah, selling for $30 million. What a disaster that's been in my life. And I'm sure Mike's on his island somewhere. Oh, it's great for the two of you. <laughs> yeah, Not no. so great for everyone else. Um, well, you know, listen, it's uh, media companies don't grow to the moon. I mean, that's one of the things you have to realize. I mean, you have to. They do if you wait long enough. They just well, take a while. It's been very hard for tech. If you have a, if you have a vertical publication, very few vertical publications have broken $100 million sales. It's very hard. If that's something Bleacher bigger like. Reported. Which one did? Blue yeah, Blue Report. Report did, but that's a very big category. Like, sports is a magnitude bigger than tech, I think. So, anyway, um, you can debate that another time. Uh, any thoughts, Brian? Uh, the bigger bet is on the talent, and I wish them well. It should be fun drama to watch. Uh, obviously, the site and the platform and the brand still retain value, but as soon as the people who made it happen leave, it tends never to be the same. And again, I like the people better than I like uh, the corporation that owns the, the website. So, you know, I don't really care. Uh, hey, I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right for like the insiders and the early adopters and the power fans. But I think there is like a whole long tail of people who have no idea. And Jason, I no, want to point out mean, one thing that we just, I'm sorry, go I ahead. I just mean, I'm, I'm betting on whatever their new venture is to be wildly successful. And I think that's what we are interested in because we are yeah. insiders watching the people. So, For sure. I just want to say there's an interesting little um, uh, tweak to this that we actually just wrote about. Um, you breaking back news. In the early, <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I don't, it's more breaking insight than breaking news. But you remember back in the early days of Twitter when people could manually be put on the suggested user list. Like right. every one of the tech blogs was put on there. Well, so that's why VentureBeat has, you know, a million person Twitter list, with, you know, Twitter account, which you could argue is one of their biggest assets. You know, TechCrunch did, all these others. Hard for us now because you know, they don't do it now. And it was just by virtue of timing, if you were a tech blog in that era, you got this huge asset that has proved super, super valuable. So interestingly, Twitter put Kara on the suggested user list and not the All Things D account because I think there wasn't one for a while. So actually, the inflated sort of blog uh, Twitter account that was given to them by Twitter is actually Kara's personal account 
not all things D. So actually, in one of the biggest assets that I think that they have as a publication is able to leave with her. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, um, and that show, and that is something to consider. Your personal brand is so portable now because of the Twitter following, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's something that all publishers are going to have to deal think, with. And just think, if Twitter had happened to put the All Things D account the way they did with VentureBeat or yeah, TechCrunch or whatever, 50, instead of Kara's, yeah. she'd have fifty thousand, and they'd have a million left. I mean, yeah. it's a, it makes a massive difference. Absolutely. Hey, um, Sarah's got a lot of great stuff going on, including uh, she's going to be interviewing a really interesting guy, Chris Hughes, who was one of the early um, one of the early Facebook folks who went and bought the New Republic uh, and is doing all kinds of interesting stuff with his money. Uh, when is that occurring? Uh, it's next week in New York. Oh, so next week in New York, September 26th from 6 to 9 p.m. You can go to Pando or do a search for Pando Monthly. It's an excellent series where um, Sarah. Can I tell you who we have through the rest of the year? Yeah, yeah. Who else do you got? So um, in L.A., we yep. have Mark Suster. Oh, and fantastic. And then we have Jason Calacanis. Wow, huge get. <laughs> and then in New York, we've got we've got our like our our mogul series. We've got uh, Chris Hughes, and then we have Henry Blodgett. So we are wow. focusing on disruption of media through the end of the year. And then in New in San Francisco, we have Mark Andreessen and Dick Costolo. Wow, what a what a what a lineup there! Dick Costolo, Jason Calacanis, Mark Houston, Mark Andreessen, Chris Hughes. I almost feel like I don't belong on that list. Wow, you got all these winners and then me. You don't, but I like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely entertaining as an interview, but the interesting thing is Inside.com will have just launched uh, six days earlier, so that'll be uh, an interesting discussion we'll have. Hey, Brian, some plugs from the Copy Blogger. Everybody go to copyblogger.com, of course. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'd like to say thanks for having me on. The structure sensor people just invited me over to the office on Twitter to check out the tech, so I'm <laughs> about to geek out. Um, awesome. And yeah, so uh, if you're interested in this whole thing, uh, you know, uh, starting up a company with an audience first rather than going with a product and, and trying to find an audience for it, head over to copyblogger.com up at the top. There's like a series, 14 ebook series of free training. Register for it, sign up, and uh, if you want to do business with us down the road, that would be fantastic. All right, listen, get in there, everybody. Copyblogger.com will teach you uh, how to make great content for your startup. It's critical, as you can see, even the mighty Sequoia um, taking uh, Copyblogger's advice and getting into the content business. Thanks a lot to producer Gina. You're rocking it. Brandis, crushing it. Uh, and the whole team over at Launch uh, actually doing a great job. The Launch Mobile and Wearables Conference uh, looks like it will sell out. Lots of great sponsors. And then the Launch Hackathon is coming after that. Launch Festival in February. Follow at Launch. Yes, we have at Launch. No, we're not on the suggested user list yet. Uh, and you can follow me. I'm at Jason. <laughs> Sarah is at Sarah Kuda. Sarah Kuda, S-A-R-A-H, and then Kuda, C-U-D-A. Brian Clark is at Brian Clark. Uh, that's at it. At Copy Blogger. At, at Copy Blogger. At Copy Blogger. That's the at better account. At Copy I only talk about Breaking Bad. I thought you were on, saying on you were trying Clark. to get away from Copy Blogger. Well, exactly. that's the, where the value is. You don't want to follow me. We are a family, <laughs> Brian. We're a family, Brian. <laughs> How's that for a Breaking Bad reference, huh? Nice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, listen, uh, everybody have a great day. Follow at TWI Startups, and we'll see you. Oh, yeah, and by the way, here's a little plug. Thanks to my friends at Swell, Swell App. Go get the Swell App. They're doing an amazing job promoting This Week in Startups. I love you guys at Swell. It's a beautiful app. I've been using it every day. Absolutely fantastic. Basically, on the ride in, I use Swell. On the ride home, I use Audible. Love both of those applications. Great job, Swell app, in promoting This Week in Startups. Uh, there's a plug for you. And for your competitors, hey, take a memo. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>